Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode of the Women's Hair Loss Project podcast. Today, I have a great guest. His name is Joe Tillman, and he is the hair transplant mentor. He has been in this industry, working in this industry for 18 years, helping men and women that are dealing with hair transplants and looking to have hair transplants done. Um, He is also, by the way, the co-host of Spencer Coburn's The Ball Truth. And he is a vast oracle of knowledge when it comes to this field in so many different ways. And so I wanted to bring him on because hair transplants and women is a hot topic that people don't know about. And I personally do not think that women that have androgenetic alopecia, such as myself, are candidates for hair transplantation, and they could find themselves severely, potentially, you know, on the wrong end of the stick. With that said, thank you so much for being here with me, Joe. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So um, I gave a little bit about you, a little bit of history about you, Uh but I really want to know more about your history, actually, to start with. Like, how did you get into this field? Uh, Purely by accident. It was it was the furthest thing from my mind. Um, I I got my first hair transplant in so long ago. I forgot here. I think it was 1992. I was 22 years old and I had the first of two hair transplants that were really bad experiences. And the only reason why I had a hair transplant to begin with was because my best friend from high school, uh, we were still, we were best friends in college as well. He called me up one day and said, I need you to come with me on a road trip. I said, why, where, where are we going? He said, well, we're going to go to a hair transplant clinic. I'm having a consultation. And I pretty much have him to thank or blame. I still haven't <laughs> figured that one out yet. You don't know whether uh, to for... cheer him or punch him. It, pretty much, pretty much. And so long story short, we were sitting in the office of this doctor and he was talking to my friend saying you know, all these great things about what they could do to help him. And he turned and looked at me and said, we can help you too. And I said, you weren't even, you you weren't even there me? for yourself. I was, Yeah, exactly. I was just there for moral support. Right. Yeah. And so he looks at me, he goes, well, you're losing your hair. I said, no, I'm not. He goes, yes, you are. I said, maybe I am. Maybe I should do this. And next thing you know, it was, I, I think it's quite literally a week and a half later, we were back in the office. We both were sitting in our respective um, chairs and it was a mom and pop operation where the pop was the doc, uh, mom was the head nurse and the daughter uh, in this family was the secondary nurse. And it was those three working on both of us oh my God. on the same day. Sounds like and a great location. We got, well, yeah. And um, so that set up the future where I had permanent shock loss from the procedure uh, that never recovered. I had mini micrografting, which was the old style of doing strip surgery where the grafts were pluggy and they, they, they looked like these, you know, giant ant legs sticking out of my head vertically, you know, kind of like the Ken doll effect that mm. you see on, uh, on, um, on some really bad hair transplants. And then I kept losing all of my hair. So by the time I was 31 years old, I was completely bald on top what we call a Norwood six, almost a Norwood seven, which is on the extreme end of the hair loss, male hair loss chart. And the only hair I really had on my head to speak of were those bad looking graphs that were done nine years prior. And I had to get that fixed. I had to do something. And um, I found a doctor in Vancouver, Canada. I was living in Seattle at the time. And he, he turned things around for me. So I wound up documenting my experience with him, uh, Dr. Jerry Wong. And I, w- I wound up being the first guy on the planet to really blog in near real time about what it's like to go through a successful hair transplant. That's amazing. And what year was that, by the way? This line? was before blogging. This was before blogging was even a word. It was uh, 2002, okay. March 2002. Yeah. March 18th, to be exact. Um, coming up on the anniversary of that mm-hmm. this month. And um, so before I knew it, things just kind of exploded. I was getting emails. Remember, 2002. Um, email wasn't even really common. Uh, but I was getting emails from people in Russia. I was getting emails from people in Japan, Brazil, worldwide, asking me more information about what I'd been through. And these were... Um, uh, other repair patients and people that had never had surgery that were curious about my own experience just from a, a first-time point of view. 
So that that mushroomed into my second job unofficially because at the time I was an enterprise level IT sales in Seattle and I was, you know, I was on Microsoft campus selling stuff and, you know, going to a little company called Amazon and selling them printers and all this stuff. But this was my passion. And it eventually got to the point after about a year of this, I said, why don't I make this my career? And fast forward, I started working for the clinic and I was there for 11 years. And um, mm, that's amazing. It, 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 was, it was a phenomenal, I guess, experience overall because I had the surgery and then I had a second surgery right before I started working for the clinic. And then I went up having more surgery simply because the OR was 50 feet away from my desk. And right. I went up being the guinea pig for the clinic. And, yeah. and eventually um, I had nine surgeries with this, wait, nine, seven surgeries with the clinic. Um, nine if you include my first two repair procedures. And then I had one more with the clinic just last year four and a half years after I left the clinic, because I, I resigned from my position back in, uh, what was it, August of 2014, to do what I'm doing now, which is acting as an independent guide for patients and um, an independent guide for clinics, where right. um, I, I review clinics and you know, they're, they're placed on my website, hairtransplantmentor.com. They're placed on my YouTube channel where I talk about why I think they're worth considering. Um, but then I also guide them on the back end and kind of act like an advisor for their, their, their practice. So I, I, got, I wear a bunch of hats right now that um, is a continuation of what I used to do for the one clinic. And it's, it's great. I love it. So, I mean, that's an amazing story, by the way, taking something that was something that was, you know, a hardship to begin with. I mean, you got plugged, literally. And, you know, <laughs> you know, and yeah. then to, and making that <laughs> you got a, plugged. Yeah. And making that into a career, you know, where you get to actually help people, which is phenomenal. Anybody that gets to take something that's like destructive to their life and make it great is, you know, is doing something extra special. So I commend you for that. Thank you. I want to get down to um, the nitty gritty of. Um, Go uh, yeah, I'm going to get you down to the nitty gritty of something that I'm sure that a lot of doctors aren't going to want me to say, but I'm going to say it uh -huh. anyways, okay. <laughs> because okay. it's a, because, uh, because, you know, they would probably disagree because it impacts their business. But it is my opinion, it's my belief that uh -huh. women that suffer from female pattern hair loss, as you know, which is endogenetic alopecia and is the diffuse thinning of hair, um, are not candidates for hair transplantation, although I know hair transplant doctors are performing surgery on women like me. I know that, mm -hmm. from what I know and understand, this is not going to be a viable option and is likely going to highly mess you up in the, for the most part. But I want you to tell me, what is your opinion on women getting hair transplants, if they're a candidate, and in what case would they actually be a candidate? Two cases. And um, by default, that means that 90% of, of women, in my view, are not surgical candidates, full stop. Mm -hmm. Just that's it. That's, that's a minimum, 90%. 90%. Um, let's just saying it again. 90% of women are not candidates are not for hair transplantation. Boom. Okay. Putting that full out stop. there. Full stop. That's it. It's been said. Good night. Nobody get <laughs> mad at me. Make sure you send your emails to Joe Tillman. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> and uh, those will be forwarded on to Please. Women's Hair Loss Project. <laughs> I can do that. It's I can do that. I, I'm saying that because I know that it obviously it affects the population of you know people that are operating in this industry that are doing hair transplants on women. So they don't want that to be said. But I don't want women to be harmed. So that's why I have you on because it needs well, to be said. It, it it does need to be said. Um, and I, I feel. I feel good in knowing that the doctors that I work with, mm -hmm. like I have, there's a there's a specific, there's a collection of doctors that uh, I've accepted into my 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 website and my YouTube channel that I uh, I work with and I endorse, and they generally feel the same way. And in cases where we may disagree, they know that I you know I freely speak my mind about these different issues, and that's one of the things that they they respect and. Um, I, I think that anyone that says otherwise isn't necessary. They, they either don't have a grasp, like the experience with, with female hair loss that they should, or maybe their motives aren't the right motives they should have. So I'll explain 
who is not and who is a candidate, according to my experience. Right, and also um, explain, explain, explain why, if someone like myself who suffers from female pattern baldness, if I go into the chair mm -hmm. today, what is going to happen and why it won't work out for me for the most part and most likely actually 100% in my case? Well, that's that's easy. Um, first off, the potential for t uh, telogen effluvium from the procedure itself, where uh, just the trauma of having the surgery could shock out more of your hair, both in the recipient area where the hair is being placed and the donor area where the hair is being harvested from. So that could just lead to a whole mess of additional issues or, or uh, um, an escalation of the issues that you're already experiencing. Um, not to mention that the transplanted hair, uh, if, your, if your situation is universal throughout the scalp, then the, the donor hair that they harvest, that's most likely to fall out anyway over time uh, because of the issue affecting all the hair in your scalp to begin with. And that's why most women, like that's the majority of the cases out there. Um, the, the exceptions are, like I said at the top of this, this question, I said there, there are two conditions where the, the candidacy is more on the positive side. The most positive candidate are those rare women that have male pattern hair loss, okay. that their, their hair loss is um, progressing in one of the multiple stages that men experience, meaning that the donor hair along the parietal sections of the scalp and you're the gonna, occipital. You're gonna, I'm just going to cut you off just to explain, circling back over to why when you were saying it's falling out over the scalp. You need to explain yeah. a, a, on an example of a man why they have that hair. I mean, you can use all your technical yeah. terms, the DHT-resistant hair, that wreath of hair that George Costanza maintains that allows him to be able to potentially get a transplant. Why women are not going to be able to have the same thing happen? Yeah, well, their donor hair, their, the hair that creates that wreath around the scalp and, ac and across the back, uh, the parietals on the sides and the occipitals in the back, those areas of the scalp are resistant to the causes of hair loss in men, which is usually uh, from dihydrotestosterone, uh, which is an androgen that affects the, the follicle on the cellular level. In other, in other words, the, the molecules bind to the, uh, the follicle because of the receptors. And I, I usually explain it to people that the uh, DHT is, it's almost like it's strangling the follicle because eventually the blood supply is cut off and the hair just stops, or the, the follicle just stops producing hair. Mm -hmm. um, with women, with women, it can be multitude, a, a multitude of other reasons, such as hormonal imbalance, um, low thyroid uh, production, low iron levels, um, all kinds of different things that generally don't affect Men, men is DHT. Women, it can be, but it's usually other. It's a little other bit. Factors. It's more uncertain, correct? It's a little bit more certain yeah. when it comes to men, and for women, it's a little bit like, eh, we don't really know what's going on. That's why every time I had a, a woman come in for a consultation, and I have women approach me uh, through my website, the first thing I, I ask them or suggest to them is that they. Uh, go get their blood work done. Mm -hmm. Go have their hormone levels checked. Check their iron levels. Check their thyroid. Uh, a whole, ho you know, just run the whole gamut of tests to make sure that everything's within the parameters of what would be considered to be normal. If they're not, have those issues addressed. And at the very least, like say if your iron levels are, are traditionally low and that's causing the issue, bringing those levels up doesn't necessarily mean that your hair will be restored but it does mean that there's a high likelihood that the the loss will will halt mm -hmm. um, and you can you can establish a baseline to build up from through other methods like the prp or the exosomes or you know whatever is out there aside from surgery surgery is always a last resort for men and is certainly the last resort for every woman on the planet period and because of the issues that can that can happen uh, more likely happen f to female patients as opposed to male patients. And um, you interacted with a lot of hair transplant sur surgeons, obviously, over the years. And do you feel like oh, yeah. there's still a good... I know you work with the doctors that are pretty much on board with your philosophy and probably mine, which is that yeah. most women aren't candidates, the 90%. But do you feel that still operating in this sphere of um, the industry that there's a large percentage of doctors that are still willing to operate on someone like me coming in and I've got complete diffuse hair loss, it's totally androgenetic alopecia, and I'm like, 
I want a transplant. Do you think that they'd be willing to operate? Absolutely. Absolutely. There, there are, there are so many, there's so many clinics out there today. I say clinics with quotes around it because they're, they're they, they operate more like spas and they may even uh, advertise themselves as a hair wellness spa or, or some horseshit like that, because it is, all they want is to get you, get you, you as a warm body in their chair so they can uh, get your, get your wallet open, get your purse open, get the cash and make a buck. Most of them, most of them are like this. And so when, when women and men are doing their research as to, you know, where to find someone they can talk to that can give them the straight answers as far as what their options are, um, you know, what's the cause of their hair loss? Why are they losing hair? I always tell them to start off with an IAHRS accepted member doctor in your area. You go to IAHRS.org or .com, I forgot which one it is, um, and look for doctors that that are a member of this organization because they are more likely to give the consumer, the, the patient, legitimate information to start their own path back to uh, regaining their hair or to at the very least stop their hair loss before they consider alternatives to, to restore it. And, and, and also, that's a big deal. And also navigating not being harmed. I think that's a huge thing. Navigating not being yeah, harmed. Yeah, of course. That's like, you know, step one, don't mess yourself up, you know? Yeah. Don't oh, make my situation, absolutely. step one, don't make my situation worse, right? Can't help me, don't hurt me. You know, I, I get so many people that have failed to look at that possibility. All they want to do is get it fixed. And I understand. I mean, it, you know, when when we as people find deficiencies in something that others see, like whether it be uh, something cosmetic about us or something uh, physical about us, our, our gait, how we walk, or, or maybe our teeth or you know, whatever, we want to fix it. And we don't think about the consequences of uh, what might happen if we move forward trying to fix it. So um, you know, I, on my YouTube channel, I have the doctors I, I endorse and I talk about why, but I have a, an education series called Hair Transplant Class. Right mm -hmm. now there's 20 videos in it. And the very first one, I have titled, Do Not Have a Hair Transplant. And this has actually been a really controversial video because if you look in the comments, people keep talking, oh, well, you've had so many hair transplants. Who are you to tell, tell us not to have a hair transplant? They're not listening. They're not watching it to the end and getting the gist of it where the message is, if you haven't considered you know, the, the, the fact that your hair transplant might fail, or you might have bad scarring, or there might be bad, you know, angles and directions, and it just looks fake, or just basically a bad result. If you haven't considered that possibility and what you would do to deal with it, then don't have a hair transplant until you've researched the realities of what can happen. Because when you go to these clinics, um, you're not you're not always going to get the full story. And what what I look for in clinics to work with are the ones that will inform the patient ahead of time even if they are a good candidate, that it might not work out. Like one, one of the things I can't stand about hair, tr hair restoration clinics is when they guarantee the procedure. You can't guarantee Jack except your best effort to do the best job you can, and that's where it ends. Yeah, even You can't I think guarantee e anything beyond that. Even in the most capable hands of most anything i mean there are our bodies are our own our bodies will react a certain way our bodies can reject things so even in the best surgeon's hands whether it's hair or heart there's things that can occur well that's why they call it the practice of medicine because yeah. they're constantly constantly learning and experience with new people because no two no two patients are the same just like no two people have the same physiology. However, e even identical twins how, can have a different outcome from the same doctor. However, with all of our unique physiology, and we're all not alike, there is a blanket statement that Joe Tillman has made, um, <laughs> which is 90% uh -oh. of women are not candidates yeah. for hair restoration. And I absolutely do stand by that based on my own knowledge that I've amassed and also my experience with my own hair loss because my own hair loss, my hair, when it falls out of my head, it's falling out of the side, the top, the back, behind my ear. It's falling out from everywhere. Yeah. So if we're, someone were to take a strip of hair or, you know, you do an FUE, you know, flick a unit extraction from the back of my head and move that hair that's just been falling out to the front of my head, it would just probably fall out next week or next month. And now I'm going to have yeah. a scar, very likely, on the back of my head 
and I'm going to have a lighter wallet and the distress of actually having had to go through that procedure. Well, not to mention the, yeah, well, yeah, the, the stress of going through the procedure, but the long-term stress, the waiting mm -hmm. is many times far worse than the actual procedure, even in successful candidates. The, the, the process of having a hair transplant, it's, it's not like getting your teeth fixed. It's not like, you know, having a crown where you go in and, and you have it done and, you know, you, you've got the result relatively quick, like it's uh, immediate. Um, but with hair transplantation, you got the procedure on, say, January 1st, and then you might see some sort of uh, uh, completion to the healing by March 1st, and then you might see some sort of growth starting around May 1st, and then it continues to get longer, and it's, it's an ongoing process. But those first three to five months after a hair transplant, there's a reason why it's called the ugly duckling stage. It's because even in the best candidates, the scalp is going to look worse before it starts to look better. So you, you're taking a few steps back before we take several steps forward because of the procedure. And it's sometimes people can't handle that. And even when clinics are proactive with their education about this, it can still uh, be really tough for patients because they, they're not they're not wrapping their head around the the reality of what they might be setting themselves up for. Well, um, but but I, I want to circle back real quick to that ninety percent comment. Yeah, I only I only got to one of the two patients that are candidates. Correct. I want yes. I want the other ten percent. What is the other ten percent? Yeah, the other ten percent that well, the, we're not talking about. What are they? The other 10% are, like I said, uh, first, the women that are experiencing male pattern hair loss in one of the several patterns that, that uh, we have on the Norwood Hamilton hair loss scale. Which is, more, which, is the, which nobody's understanding, which means that the typical male recession that you see on men walking around where your hair is receding either temporarily or even in the front frontally, like everybody go back to John's George Costanza here. They know who he is. And it's the whole thing is yeah. sliding backwards. So that is a male yeah. pattern of hair loss where it's thicker in the back and leaving the front. And I've seen um, in that small um, subset of female patients, I've seen a, a sizable portion where they have my, they might have a, um, like a, what's known as a Norwood 5A pattern it's diffused, but the donor region is completely intact, completely untouched, and completely healthy. That ultimately is a fantastic candidate as far as female candidates go. That's that's the that's the upper echelon of candidacy that any doctor that works on female patients would hope to see. Yeah. The other the other positive candidate, it's still a very narrow window for for these candidates, and. When you're dealing with um, diffused hair loss in females, usually it's also on the sides as well as the top and the back. But there is a subset where the back is also strong, uh, native density, untouched. Uh, it, it, I, I remember looking at patients from the back, female patients from the back of their scalp, and it's almost like a square. Hmm. It, it's, 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 real, it's, it's unusual. Uh, I don't know why this is. But there are many, many female patients that will have that square block of really strong donor hair in the back. And I have seen cases where, uh, successful cases, even long term, where donor hair was taken from this specific region of the occipital scalp, the back in that square, transplanted to the front. And even um, some patients that might have extensive loss on top, they can have a hairline constructed and then wear hair behind it. Yeah, I was thinking or, about or that, yeah. To, Add the fillers, and that's a that's segueing over to male patients. That's a popular option for uh, some male patients that have so much hair loss they can't possibly get full coverage. So if they've if they've you know become experienced wearing hair for many years and they they understand the the, uh, the upkeep and the maintenance, um, a transplant can can happen. But to build a really nice natural hairline with growing hair and then place, then uh, place, place the and then wear hair behind slightly it. Slightly behind it. So that was, I yeah. was actually thinking about that because I was like, there has to be, although I never really pondered that, but there has to be a subsect of the population of women that actually are thinning on top and they're thinning temporarily and it's still not male pattern baldness and it's still female pattern hair loss, but they're, they're maintaining yeah. that stronger um, you know, wreath, uh, so to speak, or the back of the head is maybe mm -hmm. thicker. So those women, if they're w listening or watching, um, they potentially have 
the chance to have a tra- or potentially be a candidate for a hair transplant if that's the case and time has proven that to be true what i mean is like let's not judge just based on this year but like you know i'm 21 years into hair loss now so if 21 years into hair loss i'm telling you hey this is pretty thick back here i don't think it's going anywhere then that's a pretty good uh indication that i would be a good candidate Right. Yeah. If, if, if you woke up and, and just discover this, you know, yesterday and then you start freaking out about what to do that, you know, in any there's no scenario where that makes anyone a good candidate. But um, I, I think that uh, I, I think that when you've established the the history of how your hair stacks up over time after the loss begins, then you have a better picture of, well, I'll say your your provider, your uh, medical um, uh, advisor will have a better idea of, of where you stack up in, in the long term. But, um, uh, and then this segues into another controversial, con- controversial, controversial subject about um, FUE versus FUT when it comes to female pattern hair. Oh, or that's a thing? Which one would be, loss. which one is better? Yeah. And some of the doctors I work with aren't going to like hearing this, but I stand on record that I think strip surgery, FUT, is by far the better option for females if they have the donor, the donor hair and the, the donor region. And the reason being, and this comes from being raised in a house with two sisters, and I, I heard all the hair stories you know, during the 80s, by the way, you know, when we want to be you know, big and full and you know, go through half a can of Aquanet just to stick it up. But with, with women, uh, we want, you want your hair to be full. Mm-hmm. You want to feel thick. That that's that's the sign of of of, of health that everyone's looking for. Even, even guys, but with FUE, you're literally removing each follicle of hair that can have one to four hairs in it, and reducing the density on a one to one ratio. So for so if you got two thousand follicles taken out, that's on average um, four and a half thousand hairs. It's taken out of your scalp. So what's going to happen to the fullness that the, that the, the patient has? Mm-hmm. It's going to diminish. So if you already have diminished density and you don't want to have any, you know, any less fullness into your hair, FUE is not, not the option. When you're taking out a strip from a very concentrated area and then that wound is closed, there's no perceivable difference with the density in that donor region. So the, you're saying follicular unit extraction will provide a lower dense result? Yes. Yeah, in the donor area. In the donor um, area. The, yeah, the donor area is reduced um, on a one-to-one ratio uh, to each extraction for density. Okay, so this has so, nothing to do with the recipient area. It's actually the donor area you're no. speaking of. The donor area, okay. yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, absolutely. So with strip surgery, you're taking the the hair from the sweet spot and you're taking out not just the hair, but also the tissue that houses it. So you have this open wound that's closed and uh, assuming everything heals properly, it's maybe two to three millimeters wide. I get what you're saying. uh, Mm -hmm. Where where, where there's no hair, but it's full density above and below that. And it's imperceptible. To, to the patient once everything's healed this up. This is my layman's, um, let me just throw this out in my own layman's way. So strip surgery for, for people that want to hear my version of it, but basically in the most you know basic way possible, it's removing a strip of your hair from basically, it's, uh, is it, it's like almost ear to ear, no? Is it kind of like ear to ear, like a smiley face in the back? Well, it depends on on the patient, but yeah, it, okay, it, so essentially it's ear to ear. It's a strip, so it's a strip. It's removed uh, from the back of your head, and then they that strip is removed, and they take the hairs. But that part is then sewn together, and so what's on top and what's below is the same density as it was before. So now you just you have a fine line there, but no, the density mm-hmm. hasn't changed with follicular unit extraction, where each of the uh, follicles or groupings of follicles are being removed. It is actually pulling or cherry picking from the area. So you're not going to have that closure with the same density on the top and the bottom. It's actually pulling from here, there, here, there, here, there, here, there. So the entire area is going to have an overall less dense quality. Yeah. There you go. Well said. Okay. That's, Just want to make sure I got it. That's it in a nutshell. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you got it. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what you're talking about. I actually, I but actually, no, to be honest with you, this right here. I just learned. This is, you just taught me something and I thought I knew a lot about a lot of things, but who knew I didn't. I just learned that that it actually make, and that actually makes perfect sense now that you've said it and I did not know that before. So thank you for sharing that because I'm learning stuff all the time.